Coming up on show 726, the Tesla Model Y is now in the hands of owners and some of them have found themselves a heat pump. We'll tell you more. Stick around. Plus, talking about how EVs produce less CO2 than petrol vehicles, why the 2021 Chevy Corvette C8 will go hybrid, Jaguar Land Rover's plans for electric crossovers, and a Swiss rider on a Harley Davidson live wire setting a long distance record. Well, good morning, good afternoon. Or good evening, in fact, wherever you're listening around the world. Welcome to EV News Daily, the edition for what happened on Monday, 23rd of March. It's Martin here, and I go through every EV story, so you don't have to. Thank you to a new producer signing up, a new Patreon producer. I'm surprised at the moment. I'm dead surprised with what's happening around the world. Uh, I thought people would be just, you know, tightening their belts and doing, you know, things like Patreon support. I presumed wrong. People are supporting this podcast, and thank you so much to you, Mads. Uh, Mads Anderson, or rather Mads Gibble or Jibel, Veg, Veg Anderson. My goodness me, I've got your name wrong so many ways in there. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for being a new producer of this here podcast. And thank you to myev.com as always for helping me make the show. If you'd like to find out more about what myev does in the USA, if you're buying and selling EVs, at this difficult time, check out myev.com. Okay, let's talk about this landmark study which has been done, which I think is worth bookmarking just so you've got it to send to people when they say, oh, EVs aren't any better than normal cars because you charge your car on electricity, which is powered by coal. Yeah, we know that's not true. But we hear it all the time. EVs produce less carbon dioxide than petrol cars across a vast majority of the globe. Contrary to the claims of those detractors who have alleged that the CO2 emitted in the production of electricity and their well, manufacturer of the actual cars outweighs the benefits, reports The Guardian today. Well, the finding is a boost to governments all around the world, including the UK government, seeking to move to net zero carbon emissions which of course will require a massive expansion in the EV car fleet. You know it's coming. I know it's coming. It is on the way. Across the world, passenger road vehicles and household heating generate about a quarter of all emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. And that makes EVs essential, say The Guardian, to reducing overall emissions. But how clean is an EV? Well, it all depends on how the electricity is generated the efficiency of the supply, and the efficiency, indeed, of the vehicle as well. Well, the only exceptions that they found in this study were some outlying cases where the grid was very, very, very dirty. Researchers in this study found that 53 out of 59 regions around the world, uh, comprising 95% of all the areas they surveyed, EVs, and in fact domestic heat pumps as well, uh, generate less carbon dioxide than fossil fuel powered cars or boilers. And like I say, those countries like Poland, well, they're the outliers. In countries like Sweden, now Sweden gets most of their electricity from renewables. In France is largely nuclear. Now there's a debate around nuclear in terms of how green is it. Okay, let's talk about CO2 emissions and let's not worry about the concrete required to build nuclear power stations. But the CO2 savings, if you are using nuclear, which many people say is the answer, I remain unconvinced, but many people say that nuclear is a very important part of base load in terms of the grid. Uh, places like France that are all nuclear, um, like 70% more efficient in terms of CO2 emissions over fossil cars. It's an amazing study. Uh, Jean-Francois Mercure of Exeter University said this, and I quote, The answer is clear. To reduce carbon emissions, we should choose electric cars and household heat pumps over fossil fuel alternatives. And these are the scientists behind, or one of the scientists behind this study. And I'll pop a link to The Guardian so you can read more in the show notes of this landmark study. OK, let's move on to the lead story on today's podcast. The Tesla Model Y is being delivered to customers, has been uh, since before the virus outbreak. But now more and more, more people are making those YouTube videos of test drives of 0 to 60. And in fact, one of them has even taken it apart. And no, it's not the Monroe videos where they take apart every nut and every bolt. But it's someone who wanted to find 
a heat pump. You see, a heat pump is something that is not found in Teslas, and that's why the Model Y is different for colder climates than the S, the 3 and the X. Heat pumps are designed to be more energy efficient and provide a more reliable range in cold weather conditions because they don't require so much energy to heat up the cabin, says Tesla Rati. The Tesla owner, Eric Strait, on his YouTube channel, disassembled the front end of his Model Y, took the frunk apart, and underneath all the covers found where they're hiding the Model Y's heat pump. He removed the plastic liners in the frunk and found the heat pump located on top of the front motor assembly. Cooler lines are seen running through the vehicle's firewall and to a location where Tesla's Hardware 3 computer resides, that kind of direction. Elon Musk as well, very, very proud of this technology on Twitter yesterday saying and tweeting about it, saying it's some of the best engineering. I'm paraphrasing now, I can't find the tweet, but it's some of the best work the team have done at Tesla. And when you think about all the pretty cool things they've done, actually, well, he really signal, uh, sort of picks this out as something that says, or singles this out as saying, the heat pump on the Model Y is something to really, really be admired. And of course, as I mentioned, this technology in cold, colder climates can get you more range from the battery because you can heat up the cabin in a more efficient way. I'll pop a link to Tesla Rati in the show notes if you'd like to read more. Okay, moving on. Jaguar Land Rover is a company that I like to keep an eye on, take a look at. Fascinates me because they've got the iPace and they know how to make a great EV. But what are they doing next? I really want them to have a great range of EVs because not only are the, com- are the cars made here, of course, in the UK, but they really add something to the EV market. According to a report today from Autocar here in the UK, uh, Jaguar Land Rover's historic plant at somewhere called Castle Bromage is going to produce two, not one, but two new pure electric crossovers. They're going to be called the Jaguar J-Pace and a Land Rover model. At the minute, it's dubbed the Road Rover. And we have talked about this on the podcast before, as these rumours have previously surfaced. Now today, according to Electric, the two new Jaguar Land Rover models will go on sale by the end of next year in 2021. Both vehicles are going to be built on a new architecture called the MLA. Not really important that it's called that, but that's what they've called it. And so we will talk about the MLA platform. Jaguar Land Rover are investing £1 billion, about $1.15 billion US dollars, to convert their Castle Bromage and Solihull plants to produce MLA cars. That means electric cars. And there have been hints since last year that the Jaguar I-Pace will eventually move to an MLA platform when the second generation version of that is created, taking it back from being made externally by an external producer, a company called Magna, and making it themselves, vehicles built on the MLA platform are going to have a 90.2 kilowatt hour battery. And that's interesting. That's a big old battery with good efficiency, good software. It's all the range you'll probably need for the kind of cars they make. Okay, from four wheels to two, let's talk about... Harley Davidson and their all-electric bike, the Live Wire. Harley Davidson's Live Wire has about a hundred miles of riding range, so it's not as well suited to those really long road trips as a gasoline-powered sibling in the Harley Davidson stable. But that doesn't mean it can't go the distance. There's a Swiss rider called Michel Von Tell, and Michel prov- uh, proved that by setting a new 24-hour distance record on a Harley electric model that you can indeed do long road trips on all-electric Harley-Davidson, says Autoblog. Von Toll's record-setting trip was 1,070 miles, took him to four countries, took 23 hours and 48 minutes, and he covered the distance on his own, and he comfortably beat the old record. 818 miles is what he was trying to beat. That was set by a team of seven riders, who took turns going round in circles on a test track on a electric Zero SR. Well, things like data on how much lecky he used during his trip, how many times he stopped to charge and how fast the charging was, not revealed yet, but Harley-Davidson say they will soon be making that data available over coming days. I'll be keeping an eye out on their PR department and I'll bring you that news. That's really interesting and it's great always to see records being set in EVs, whether it's two wheels or four or something of more curious nature as well, but we love anything like that that grabs the attention. So the Audi e-tron is an electric car. The Audi e-tron is also a hybrid car because the e-tron is the sub-brand name of 
the plug-in cars that Audi used to make before the full electric e-tron. Confused? Yes, I still am. Why on earth they chose the e-tron name? Because there was the Audi A3 e-tron, which was the same as the normal Audi A3, but had a plug socket on. So e-tron was the name like like, like a subreddit, if you like. Um, the name they gave to their plug-in cars, their electrified car range. So, of course, when they came out with a full electric car, what would they call it? Also called the e-tron. And then when they released their second one, they also called it the e-tron. Although this time they called it the e-tron 50. Now, the 2021 Audi A3 is going to be hitting the United States before the end of this year, according to car and driver citing inside sources. The A3 in the USA will come with either with a two-litre turbocharged four-cylinder and mile hybrid assisted engine making 240 horsepower, says Motor1.com. But in comparison, the A3 hatchback in Europe will offer buyers more options, unlike the USA. We do like our A3s here in Europe. The base unit will be a one-litre three-cylinder engine. A 1.5-litre engine is also available without or with mild hybrid assistance, and there'll be two plug-in hybrid versions as well. And that's great news. Using a 1.4-litre turbocharged engine, uh, an electric motor, six-speed dual-clutch gearbox, and that, of course, will be called the Audi A3 e-tron. Yes. Confused? Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, the e-tron name being used uh, quite uh, generously across the Audi cars. Let's talk about charging. And the British charging provider Podpoint, recently acquired by EDF, the French state-owned electricity company, has selected Australian manufacturer Tritium as their supplier of DC fast chargers, says Inside EVs. The agreement concerns the new 50 kilowatt DC fast chargers. They're the ones coming to Podpoint and will be used in existing and indeed future network rollouts across the UK. The units might well be installed in Tesco stores in the UK. Big supermarkets here. We do... It's a curious thing, which I learned recently because everyone's been buying toilet paper at the supermarket. So there's been lots of articles in the newspapers about are the supermarkets coping? And then I realized as I was reading these articles because of coronavirus that actually there are more supermarkets or rather we all shop in supermarkets more than other countries. And so for some reason, I didn't realize this, maybe you knew it already, that the UK is kind of addicted to supermarkets. We don't really do the, the kind of medium-sized stores that many countries do, even the smaller stores. We just love a big supermarket. So we all shop there. We all buy a toilet paper and uh, store 4,000 rolls of it in the garage in case we run out because of a virus, which doesn't cause you to have the squits. Anyway, let's move on. Let's not talk about the idiocy of the, the general public right now. Um, this is a location where Podpoint have been putting charges in. They've got a deal with Tesco. There's, there's three. Then there's five Tesco big, they call them Tesco Extra. There's five Tesco Extras within reasonable driving distance of my house. And they've all had the Podpoints, four Podpoints put in. And if that rollout continues uh, and they haven't put them into the Tesco stores near you, then they may well be using these Tritium ones. They are equipping 600 Tescos with free charging. The agreement ensures Tritium's 50 kilowatt DC fast charging, uh, renowned for like a compact design and um, ease of use. They are, I think they're the ones used by Instavolt, I think. I like them. I like these Tritium ones. Uh, used now by Podpoint as part of their nationwide EV rollout under their new ownership of EDF. Uh, they chose Tritium, they say as the preferred DC rapid charger supplier because of the proven reliability of them. And it enables Podpoint to offer customers the ability to add branding to each charger. I'll pop a link to Inside EVs in the show notes if you'd like to read more. Moving on. Porsche is continuing plans to make the Macan, a car that we've talked about recently on the podcast as well, getting a fair bit of attention right now. The Macan crossover is going to be an all-electric Porsche. It's a significant move, as the Macan is currently Porsche's best-selling model. In a report of its 2019 financial results, Porsche reiterated the Macan will be the second fully battery-powered model series after the Taycan, says Green Car Reports. Uh, well, the automaker previously said that the electric Macan would launch in 2022. It will arrive after the upcoming Taycan Cross Turismo wagon. And Porsche said that the uh, electric Macan will replace the gasoline model entirely. That's the knowledge that I'm working to. But, you know, maybe I should tap up uh, one of the actual supporters of this 
podcast. And that would be Porsche of the village in Cincinnati. I mean, they sell Porsches after all. So maybe I should tap them up for some knowledge and say, what have you heard? Is the McCann going completely electric or will there be a fossil version of it kicking around in a couple of years time? Well, it has left the door open for the current generation McCann to be sold alongside the next generation McCann, which will be all electric. I guess that's one way that it could shake out. Uh, Porsche's wording signals the company doesn't intend for the transition to last long, though. But like I say, still a bit woolly. The McCann is a car that, in an all-electric form, will be really, really popular in a couple of years' time. There's going to be lots of EVs on the market, but another all-electric Porsche is going to be very good news. Question of the week this week. So with all of the world events happening at the moment, I'm asking you how the EV community can come together at this time to support each other and what can we all do to help each other and anything that comes to mind. I don't know. I don't have any answers on this one, but it feels like it's a a good time to ask that question. What can the EV community do to come together. And if you haven't heard the news, we have indeed been put on lockdown now, much like Italy and France and many other countries around Europe. The UK, as of now, really, the Prime Minister has has made his speech on TV in a special address that uh, all the channels ran. Uh, he was uh, He's just been saying that we're now on lockdown, so the shops are closed from tomorrow onwards. Deep joy. Uh, However, what needs to be done needs to be done, and we will all get behind it. But what can the EV community do to support one another at this time? I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email me anytime. Hello at evnewsdaily.com or leave a comment on the YouTube show. Well, there are 241 patrons of the podcast, and the generosity of those people, those companies, uh, make this podcast happen every day. We share the knowledge, we share the passion of EVs, we share, hopefully, with whether you are listening to this podcast for a long time or whether you're new. I can see the stats are growing all the time and it's getting bigger all the time. So if we're spreading the word uh, far and wide around the world, uh, you can thank the Patreon supporters for that. If you'd like to find out what it's about, by the way, Patreon is a website. They look after, like, your credit card details. It's mega secure. Lots of people use it uh, to support creators. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash evnewsdaily. So our premium partners, we say hello to all the time, are Phil Roberts of Electric Future at ef.energy. If you want to check out the website for that company, Brad Crosby. Thank you, Brad, for your continued support. Avid Technology, uh, making the bits that go inside EVs. Uh, Brightsmith for clean tech talent, a uh, great new company on the scene helping to find people for jobs and jobs for people. That's not their their catchphrase. I made that up. They might not like that. But anyway. uh, And new, the Porsche of the village Cincinnati. Not the Porsche, just Porsche of the village Cincinnati. And uh, Audi Cincinnati East. Thank you very much for your kind support. 725 shows in that there archive. Go check them out if you'd like to hear more. In the uh, in the archive, the old shows. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And do remember, there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid. <laughs>